Well, let me uh, start with the introduction of uh, Dr. Paul Jacobs from Qualcomm. Uh, we've had a, a great day so far. Um, the U.S. Ambassador was here, the Deputy Energy Secretary, a couple of panels on the development of an Indian uh, ecosystem uh, for innovation and how the United States can be a good partner in that. Uh, another session that just preceded this, looking at university partnerships and, uh, and, and some great uh, uh, colleagues that, uh, that already have innovation partnerships and are looking to expand them. Uh, now we move on to, uh, to the last two sessions for the day. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Paul Jacobs uh, from Qualcomm uh, will deliver a, a keynote address. Uh, you know, Dr. Jacobs, uh, Executive Chairman and Chairman of the Board of Qualcomm Incorporated, where he's responsible for helping guide the development of new technologies and Qualcomm's long-term opportunities. Uh, also a member of the U.S. India CEO Forum, and so big meetings that will be taking place uh, while he's in town this time. He's a leader in the field of mobile communications for more than 25 years and a key architect of Qualcomm's strategic vision. Dr. Jacobs spearheaded Qualcomm's efforts to develop and commercialize mobile technology breakthroughs that have contributed to the growth of both the company and the industry. Some of the important developments that began under Dr. Jacobs include the smartphone based on Palm OS, inclusion of GPS capabilities in mobile phones, uh, the Brew platform, which enables over-the-air downloading of applications. Also, following the completion of his PhD in 1989 and a year as a postdoctoral researcher at a French government lab in Toulouse, Dr. Jacobs joined the company full-time in 1990 as a development engineer leading the mobile phone uh, digital signal processor software team. Uh, apart from, of course, his work uh, with the U.S. India CEO Forum, we're also pleased that Qualcomm is, uh, is one of the contributors to the U.S. India Innovation Forum, which has allowed this initiative to, uh, to get off the ground. So, Dr. Jacobs, uh, the floor is yours. Please, sir. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, wait, I can get my slides up there. Do I? What do I need to do? Click. Yep. Oh, we're getting that uh, going. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here at uh, this innovation forum and. As you heard, uh, you know, I'm a member of the U.S.-India uh, CEO Forum, and it was uh, one of the initiatives out of the CEO Forum to discuss perfect uh, innovation to find a way to improve innovation uh, partnerships between India and the United States. And I think uh, for Qualcomm, it's been something that's just uh, kind of natural for us um, we're all about building ecosystems, and uh, for myself, uh, the connection to India is quite long-term. Uh, when I was a young engineer, I came to India as uh, one of the first engineering teams to deploy wireless local loop technology here uh, back in the early 90s. And so ever since then, Qualcomm's had a very long uh, history of working in India, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that uh, as we talk about uh, mobile technology and its, uh, its ability to be a catalyst for, for innovation. And it really starts off by the fact that uh, you know, it's, re it's no hype to say that uh, mobile technology is humanity's biggest platform, biggest technology platform. It touches more people than, than any other thing. And, and we all know that we see it here in terms of the people who have access to the internet over mobile devices. And, uh, traffic has gone mobile and the mobile devices are less expensive and they've uh, therefore been able to spread out to more people. And uh, now there's uh, 7.4 billion connections globally. Now that doesn't mean 7.4 individual people. It's about half that in terms of individu individual users. But we see that growing uh, quite rapidly over time and, and really um, Mobile technology spans all geographies. It spans all socioeconomic uh, positions. Uh, it's so widespread, it's probably more widespread than electricity, more widespread than, it's been said, uh, toothbrushes, which is, says something. I always thought to myself, boy, if somebody's not using a toothbrush, I'm glad they're calling me on the phone instead of talking <laughs> to my face. But anyways. It's, it's really driven a lot of uh, economic value. The, the mobile industry uh, in 2015 generated uh, $3.1 trillion of economic value, which was about 4.2% of global GDP, and direct employment of 17 million people and indirect uh, employment of another 15 million. 
So it's, it's quite, the, quite a platform from an economic standpoint. If we look at India in particular, uh, the slide, what the slide is showing is the service prices coming down and the penetration, the usage rate, number of users going up. And one of the things that we're very proud of, and I told this story about being here for Wireless Local Loop, um, this, the place where the prices for service started to come down was when we first launched um, uh, Wireless Local Loop in uh, 99 with MTNL, and that uh, initiated reductions in the GSM tariffs, which GSM was really the predominant uh, system at the time. And then in 2001, TRAI allowed the uh, wireless local loop operators to provide limited mobility, and those limited mobility tariffs were much lower than the predominant uh, you know, full mobility uh, GSM tariffs. So that drove a lot down. And then in 2003, the CDMA operators got full mobility licenses, and that continued to, to drive things down. And so um, you know, it's been this dynamic over time of driving the cost of of the service down, and we see that continuing even today. Uh, and we hope to see even more of that in terms of mobile broadband driving the cost down, because that is the fundamental lifeblood. And then uh, beyond that, we've done a lot of work, obviously, to make the device prices come down as well and to bring um, a, a lot of uh, technology. And I'll, ta I'll touch on that in a, in a few moments. But it's really been working with a, a large number of partners in India and around the world to, to cause that to happen. And, and so now what's going on is you see not just connectivity for voice, but broadband connectivity. And this number, 540 million, is the estimated number, uh, actually it would be more than that, estimate of uh, mobile uh, connections in, uh, with 3G, 4G. And what that means is it's not just voice, it's data. And in fact, it's broadband data, which means that that enables all sorts of other applications. Uh, and we're very interested in many different kinds of applications because what's happened is there's been a lot of investment in the, in the cellular industry to drive cost down, power consumption down, size down, and features and performance up. And we sucked a lot of other devices into the phone. And now what we see with these kinds of capabilities in the network that things will go from the phone into other areas and they will enable many other industries, whether it's healthcare and education and public safety and e-government and I mean, entrepreneurship. I mean, you can think of any, any area, any, any industry can be, can be touched by this. Um, the, uh, if you look at uh, you know, what's happening in terms of the data traffic, which is what's underlying this, the demand is incredibly strong in terms of, of consumers' desire to have more mobile data. And so uh, in 2015, the data traffic grew 89% year over year, 74% uh, in 2014. So it's even accelerating as time goes on. So it's a curve that looks like the proverbial hockey stick. It's going up rapidly. Um, I don't know, should I set a cricket stick? Maybe I probably said it wrong. Um, and really, as I said, the, the key to that is having a very big ecosystem. And we're focused on uh, building that ecosystem in India as well. We started out, uh, obviously, in global markets, uh, started in the United States. But uh, the first launches of the technology were in, in Asia. And, uh, and we built from there, and we realized that the key uh, for us to be successful and key for the technology to be successful was uh, this notion of, of partnering and finding the right place in the ecosystem. We used to build phones, we used to build infrastructure. We realized that it was much better to work with partners and now that, as I said, things are getting so broad, you really can't help but work with partners. And I think one of the things that, that the company has done is put a lot of money into R&D, over $42 billion in R&D since the company's wasn't, um, was started. But what we do with that R&D is that we create ideas that are shared, whether they're shared through standards process or shared through licenses of, port of our portfolio of patents, through technology transfer. Um, all of these things uh, are what Qualcomm does. And we participate in standards bodies because we think very strongly, feel very strongly that these innovations have to be shared. 
what you see now in, in the world, there are a set of companies out there who believe that those shared innovations are less valuable and they're out trying to promote this as being less valuable and what should be protected are their proprietary things that they don't share with everybody else. We completely disagree with that point of view and, uh, and we think that it's very, very important that in order to build a big ecosystem, you must share and transfer technology and you need to build up everybody from, from the, the various different areas. And we've done this uh, very famously in Korea where you know, the big names of Samsung and LG, those were not uh, telecom manufacturers when we started working together. And then you see uh, China where Huawei and ZTE, very big, no, you know, well-known companies, but then Xiaomi and uh, others you know, coming, coming up. And so we see the same thing happening in India, uh, that there will be the local manufacturers that today predominantly are buying sub-assemblies from Chinese manufacturers and then doing assembly here, we want to see design in India. We want to see full design, full manufacturing. We want to see the complete supply chain be built in India, eventually all the way to advanced manufacturing of, of semiconductors and, and even displays and, and so forth. And, and the reason is because this revolution that I talked about in terms of the, the scope, the scale, the economic impact, you know, it's centered around these devices that we all carry with us. And I should say, when we talk about make in India, you know, we have been talking about design in India, and, and pretty much everybody who has a smartphone that has a Qualcomm chipset in it, uh, which is you know, the majority of smartphones around the world, the content in those chips was designed in India, at least some portion of that, because we have a large uh, engineering base in India. So India is powering the smartphone revolution around the world and and people talk about whether that smartphone business is slowing well let me tell you between uh, now and 2020 8.5 billion smartphones will be sold so it is a huge market it's a market with a lot of opportunity to the extent that the Indian manufacturer is able to build their capabilities for this market and tailor devices for this market they will also be able to sell those devices in into the rest of the world one other interesting point is the app ecosystem also is growing here. We've done a lot of investing in, in India, a number of different application uh, devices, uh, and in fact, uh, the largest e-commerce site here, which you all know, Flipkart, became the first Indian app uh, to cross the 50 million download mark on the Google Play Store. And that means that the bulk of its users are on mobile. So the wireless internet and the mobile internet is really the internet going into the future. And that is going to fuel the growth of a domestic app economy, which, as everyone knows, India has a tremendous uh, uh, core competency in, in, uh, in software. And so we see that as a huge opportunity. But then going forward, there's this even bigger opportunity, which is the internet of things. And that's the idea that we will take this capability that's in the smartphone and we'll put it into all sorts of other devices. And uh, there, there's, you know, when I talked about 8.5 billion smartphones, which sounded like a lot, well, the projections for Internet of Things are over 20 billion devices in 2020. So it's an even bigger market. And that market will affect all sorts of things like agriculture. I was just having some discussions with government ministers talking about how you'll have very inexpensive, low-power devices that will do things in agriculture like track livestock or measure soil conditions or drive a drone that'll fly over the fields and figure out where the crops are having problems and give information back so they can be diagnosed and the right chemicals can be applied or the right farming techniques can be applied. And so there's a lot going on there and there's a lot going on with Indian companies in, in particular and especially with startups and we're doing a lot of investing in startups. We announced with the Prime Minister uh, in Silicon Valley in September, a $150 million venture fund. We've spent $23 million of that already on five companies. So there's a lot of money left to be in that venture fund to be invested in uh, IoT startups. We're doing uh, startups here. We're investing in startups here on wearables, so uh, trackers for uh, women, children. Uh, we're doing healthcare. We're working on smart city initiatives. Uh, we're partnering with the uh, Jaipur Development Authority to create an in innovation hub. And, Jaipur, and, and that, of course, supports the Prime Minister's plan to create 100 smart cities. Um, in terms of financial, we've uh, 
worked with a local partner to build a iris uh, biometric um, authentication device. And so that's for digital signatures, for money transfers, for digital ID, connects to the government's uh, uh, biometrics database. And so there's just all sorts of opportunity that, that are available when you think about using the connectivity to connect not just people to people, not just people to things, but things to things as well. There are all, all different kinds of opportunities there. And these things will also be driven by software as well as, as hardware. But we see both happening as part of Make in India and Digital India and Design in India. And so then comes down to connectivity. And we know that there's a, a vast rural population. There's a vast number of people who are unconnected. We want to make sure that there isn't a digital divide on the mobile internet the way that there has been on the, on the fixed internet. And we're doing a lot of work with mobile operators to deploy uh, 3G, 4G, and eventually 5G technology to create more and more uh, connectivity and, and better and more bandwidth for people. Uh, but one other thing that we're working on right now, which I've also been discussing with the government, is uh, we're working with a company called OneWeb to build a satellite system. And the satellite system will be over 700 satellites, so it's going to create a global broadband system. And what you'll be able to do is take a very small device, put it on the roof of a building anywhere in the world, rural villages here, that will talk up to the satellite to connect to the rest of the network. And down on Earth, it will have Wi-Fi and LTE coverage, so 4G coverage, uh, eventually 5G. And that will then talk to the smartphones and tablets that, that people are carrying with us with them. And so the notion is that we'll connect up schools, we'll connect up hospitals, we will connect up villages that haven't been connected, and all of this will be done from the sky. And, and it's a very, very efficient way to do it. We can generate bits at very low cost so that those bits then can be resold to uh, consumers and enterprises in regions that up till now have not been able to be connected. And so um, we'll also do things for governments, for first responders, for public safety. We'll do it for maritime. We'll do it for aviation, uh, really a broad range of things. But to me, what's really exciting, was exciting to a number of the ministers that I've talked to today, is this notion that we will be able to connect the un unconnected. And this, the constellation we're going to start to deploy in uh, 2018 and commercial uh, service in 2019, 2020. And what's even more interesting to me, and hopefully we can get this done, but we may even be able to launch uh, satellites out of, out of India as well. So you can think about the aerospace industry here uh, benefiting from it as well, because you can imagine with the number of satellites that we're talking about launching, we're the biggest uh, purchaser of launch capacity in the world already. So, and that's before we even do our next generation. Uh, I talked a little bit about the, the fact that uh, I had uh, made this commitment for um, supporting make in India and, and design in India with the Prime Minister. And, uh, and I, I just would say that Qualcomm is 100% behind this vision of, of digital India and, and make in India and design in India. And, uh, and I think that uh, his vision aligns very much with this notion that mobile is this huge innovation platform. And, and a key area is driving growth, GDP growth, new job growth. Um, we expect to see more than 2 million jobs created in, in mobile over the next few years. Uh, and many of those jobs will be created with small and medium enterprises. And even uh, now, mobile is generating a lot of GDP. It's, uh, in uh, 2014, it was 2.4 percent of India's GDP. And I think that as the networks roll out and they continue to grow, um, we'll see that be even more. And the, the other thing that's really exciting is to see the focus on intellectual property that the government has as well. And I talked already about the fact that standards essential patents are somewhat under attack by those companies that wish to retain their proprietary patents and devalue the patents that are being shared with every, everybody else in the industry. But I think that the work that's being done here and the fact that design in India will create a huge amount of intellectual property for Indian companies which then they will be able to share with the rest of the world. I think that's a, a very important component of an innovation economy, which is the economy that, that the prime minister is, is trying to promote here. So I think that you know, we, we will see 
this happen, and to the extent that uh, Qualcomm can support it, it's really aligned with our model of, of how we've done business for a long time. And we have a number of initiatives underway. We have a Design in India challenge right now. There's uh, 10 companies that we selected. Already four of those companies have working hardware prototypes in the market, drones and all sorts of things like that. Um, in November, we'll down-select again, and we'll be supporting those companies. We put in place an innovation lab where we can train local companies on how to build devices, how to manufacture devices, how to develop uh, software for devices. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, work with, uh, on STEM education in particular for women uh, and, and young girls. Uh, so we have a tech, tech innovation challenge. It was uh, high school girls in Bangor, uh, a 12-week uh, course to, uh, to develop new applications on mobile. Uh, I talked about our investment fund. Um, and then we're doing a, a new wireless reach program. Wireless reach is our, our program where we use wireless technology for social benefit. And we have a, a project that we're doing with the Digital Empowerment Foundation called Sutrapreneur. And the idea there is that we'll uh, get 100 kids, train them up, give them uh, tablets that are 3G and 4G connected, and they will go out to villages, serve 300,000 people or some very large number of, of people and get those people connected to the government's Digital India initiatives so that there's, there's money, there's support, there's all sorts of things that are available. These people will be trained to go out and use technology uh, to, to get uh, people connected to that. So very excited by the opportunities in India. I think uh, hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot of opportunity to, to catalyze innovation in India and in conjunction and a perfect example of a U.S.-India opportunity because Qualcomm is here. We've been here for a long time. We want to work with partners in India to, to drive innovation, to drive new job growth, to improve people's lives. So hopefully we'll get a chance to do that with many of you. Thanks very much. Yeah, we're going, going to see the Prime Minister great, now. Great, great. So. Well, thanks right. a lot for coming by. If everybody can let him exit here, and then we're going to take a, a quick break. So, great. Paul, thanks a lot for coming out for this. Thanks for thanks helping us lot. launch the Innovation Forum. If you've been such a strong supporter. So uh, we'll take a, uh, a quick break here. If everybody can uh, uh, please let Dr. Jacobs exit, since he's got a, uh, uh, another big program following just after this. And then we'll, uh, we'll head right back where we had uh, uh, just, just behind the, uh, uh, the, the room here for a for our coffee break, and we'll convene in again in about 15 minutes. So welcome to India and to the panel. Uh, on my 
extreme right is uh, Dr. Ajay Kela, Kela is the CEO of Vatwani Foundation. And uh, Vatwani Foundation, I think, has been an ecosystem player in the early state startup ecosystem for decades, not years. So welcome and welcome to India again. On my uh, immediate left is uh, Mr. Jayesh Rajan, Ranjan, uh, Secretary IT from uh, Government of Telangana. And uh, Telangana has one of those, taken those very early steps with the T Hub, and uh, we really enjoy coming there. And a couple of our companies are sitting there. And uh, Dr. Nikhil Agarwal on my extreme left, who is uh, CEO, of, CEO of Innovation Society of the Government of Andhra Pradesh, which is also gearing up to uh, create a name and a space in the startup ecosystem. And uh, for people who don't know me, I uh, run the Indian Angel Network, which is a uh, India's first and I think arguably the world's largest angel investor group for, with almost about 430, 440 investors from 10 countries. We invested in about 120 companies across 17 sectors and in 7 countries. So I think we have a very, very diverse experience and diverse perspectives that we have on this panel. So on that note, may I invite Dr. Ranjan to start. Thank you very much and uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen. As uh, was mentioned by Patmaji, I represent the state of Telangana. This is the youngest state in the country and uh, we take lots of pride in calling ourselves the startup state. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure many people in this hall would uh, feel very happy to believe that the best way government can support the startup ecosystem is to stay away from it. But uh, we in Telangana differ quite a bit from this popular and uh, public perception. Our feeling is that if we can provide a strategic support to the system, the system can actually grow many folds. And that is what we have seen in the last two years of our state coming into being. In fact, Telangana is one of the first states which has uh, come out with a very clear uh, innovation policy and I'll speak a bit more about it uh, in a while. When we started working with uh, startups and started showing an interest in the world of startups, we realized that quality infrastructure is something which is clearly lacking in all the major Indian cities and uh, today we take lots of pride that the largest technology incubator of the country, which we call T-Hub, is located in Hyderabad. It is a 70,000 SFT. 800 seater facility and the appetite, the hunger amongst the startup community for high quality infrastructure is so high that within a week it was absolutely saturated and uh, that has led us to take another very momentous decision. So while T-Hub itself is the largest in the country, we have now embarked upon building the second phase of T-Hub which will be five times bigger than this. So the first one is if it is 70,000 square feet, we are building the next one which will be 350,000 square feet and arguably it will be one now among the largest in the world. And we provide lots of uh, subsidized services to the startups which are onboarded there like uh, power and other infrastructure including one gig internet and so on and so, so forth. The reason why people have uh, mistrust of government's involvement in any se sector is the tendency to over-regulate, to micromanage and we are very very conscious of this fact. In fact, uh, T-Hub is run completely by professionals. We have chosen the best from the market and uh, they run the show. We have also tried to, we all know that Silicon Valley today is taken as the best exemplar of how a comprehensive ecosystem can develop. And we are also aware that many geographies, many governments have tried to replicate Silicon Valley with spectacular failures. So uh, when we have tried to build uh, an innovation ecosystem in Hyderabad, in, in Telangana, we have been very conscious of what could potentially go wrong and what are the critical ingredients without which the ecosystem will not be comprehensive and will not be meticulous enough. So uh, <clears throat> in the Silicon Valley, for example, we know the kind of uh, roles that uh, institutions like Stanford and Berkeley have played. So in Hyderabad, we have been very fortunate to get the presence of some of the best Indian academic institutions. So we have the Indian School of Business, we have the Triple IT, we have one of the best uh, law schools called uh, NALSA, they are all partners of DHA. And uh, 
<clears throat> we are also conscious that another limitation, which uh, another challenge with the startup space in our country is the difficulty in accessing funds, particularly at a very, very early stage, at a very nascent, incipient idea stage. So we are putting together a fund and also a fund of funds, which will be again professionally managed and made available to the startups. We also know that uh, many times the startups have uh, difficulty in getting market access, getting the first customer is uh, very often a very major uh, difficulty and in our innovation policy we have again taken a very very bold and a very transformative kind of decision which is that if any startup who is incorporated in uh, Telangana or in Hyderabad has a product or a service which is relevant to the government system we have agreed to procure it bilaterally typically the government procurement processes are very complicated and uh, they are heavily stacked against uh, a startup so uh, this kind of a facility that you can get your product consumed by the government through a bilateral kind of a discussion is something very, very useful and we have already started rolling it out. So uh, to, to kind of uh, just uh, summarize what uh, I am trying to say is that governments do have a strategic role to play. They can create the infrastructure. This t uh, phase one, it's completely funded by the state government. Half of the funding for second phase of t -Hub as I said, uh, which will be a huge, uh, uh, humongous kind of an infrastructure space, will also be put by the T-Hub. T-Hub is, the government has also put together a very uh, broad and a very talented pool of uh, mentors. We have been able to get uh, academic uh, institutions partner in our initiative. We are supporting the creation of the fund which will be available to startups. And uh, one other initiative of ours, which again is a path-breaking kind of an initiative, is that we are launching uh, outposts of T-Hub in multiple geographies which value entrepreneurship and innovation. The idea is that if there is any startup which is incorporating, incubating in T-Hub or in uh, Telangana and it has the potential of doing well in other geographies, so there must be some programs through which uh, it has that opportunity to access those markets and of course vice versa. If any good startup of that geography wants to test the Indian market, we'll be very happy to provide that uh, launching point. Right. So there are a number of roles which uh, governments can really play and we in Telangana have been very successful in demonstrating that uh, in the last uh, two years. So from government really moving into an enabler role to I think Nareg, which SBIC has been very innovative enabler, right? So we'd love to hear what you're doing now. Absolutely. Uh, so my, I'm from the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration, specifically the Office of uh, Investment and Innovation. Uh, what I like to call the office uh, is the best kept secret in the U.S. government. We are a small office, but we do uh, a lot of capital and a lot of work. Uh, prior to that, about eight to nine years in the private sector, and earlier today you heard about other people's stories and their connections to uh, India familiarly or what have you. Uh, when I originally came in uh, to the government about three years ago, um, I had come in from the private sector and I had actually started my own, own uh, startup. Um, my brother, who's an investment banker, his sister's a lawyer, I was actually headed to medical school. Uh, and uh, about three months before is when I started my own little company. Um, when I told parents about this, uh, they were very much uh, saddened that they were going to have a doctor in the family, typical to what uh, an Indian parent would say, go experiment, go fail, and then go to medical school, please. Uh, seven years later, that company uh, is, was in over 100 countries, uh, one to two million people are using it, and, uh, and the parents could never be more proud. Uh, so uh, innovation uh, and uh, entrepreneurship is a huge thing that uh, our government is pushing. Uh, specifically, our office um, has three major programs in it. I'll, I'll just kind of spell it out for you so you guys can get the image and then I'll delve into it a little bit more. Uh, our SBIR program is called Small Business Innovation Research. And what we do is we fund technologies that are high risk, high reward. Uh, you heard a lot of people talk today about uh, projects that kind of came out of DARPA, ARPA-E. Um, those were under this SBIR flagship band. Um, uh, for example, your iPhone, anyone who uses an iPhone, 70% of those components within the iPhone were seeded by SBIR. Uh, Qualcomm, uh, their executive chairman just spoke, uh, his dad 
got his start in uh, launching Qualcomm because of one and a half million dollars that came out of SBIR. It was funded specifically, I believe, through uh, DOD and NSF. Um, so uh, the program itself uh, was started in uh, the 1980s, and we we've, we've thrown in about 40 to 45 billion dollars into this program. It's a three-phase program. The first phase is a $150,000 kind of proof of concept. Uh, the second phase is uh, about a million dollars. It's about two years um, to, to kind of build out your technology. And then the third phase is commercialization. Now, people from the private sector uh, will typically ask, how do you know this program is successful? You know, you talk about the dollars you've thrown in, but what have you gotten out? Well, first and foremost, uh, the government doesn't take any equity in these technologies. Uh, our whole stake is building up these companies, creating jobs, and seeing success. But what we say is, uh, three of the largest successes that have come out of this program, Qualcomm, Symantec, and Biogen, have a market capitalization of about $120 billion, just those three companies. So you can see that just those three companies alone make up for that investment and that sum. Um, the, another uh, flagship program that we have is called SBIC, Small Business Investment Companies. Now what this is, is it's, the, it's a private equity program, it's a fund of funds. Uh, it's actually one of the largest fund of funds in the world. It's about $27.5 billion under management. And what we do is we provide the venture uh, assets to a startup private equity firms. So it's, a, it's a ratio of about two to one. So they can raise uh, about $75 million of private capital, and then we will provide a loan guarantee of another $150 million. So they'll have about $225 million that they can invest, but they have to invest in small businesses. So companies that have come out of that program are uh, Intel, Apple, uh, HP, Pandora, uh, Amgen, Biogen, and the list goes on and on. Um, so that in, its, in and of itself has been successful when we throw out names like that. The third program we've launched is, uh, it's, about the, it's the youngest program we have, it's called the Growth Accelerator Program. It's about three years old now, and uh, I was one of the ones that helped stand it up and I direct that program now. Um, and that what that is, is we provide $50,000 grants to accelerators around the country. Uh, the first year we provided $2.5 million, so we awarded 50 accelerators. Last year we provided $4.4 million, so it's about 88 accelerators. Those 138 or so accelerators helped or assisted, I should say, about 4,000 startups. Those 4,000 startups raised about $1.5 billion in follow-on funding. They created about 20,000 jobs, and those accelerators themselves uh, raised an additional quarter of a billion dollars. So our investment, our $6.9 million, which is nothing when it comes to uh, what government invests or what our government uses, uh, has paid itself at then some. So what we've done in our office is we've built out a life cycle, right? We've, uh, we've built it out so three people in a garage, your typical startup, can get seed funding with an SBIR go through our accelerator program and go through one of the accelerators that we fund and grow for the next three to five years. And at that point, when they're viable, they can go to one of the, what we call SBICs, or private equity firms, and get funding. If they're 10 million, or 20 million, or 100 million dollars, and take their technology, or take their product, national or international. And that's kind of what we're hoping we can kind of venture into with other, other nations or other entities out there. Uh, one of the things we did under this accelerator program this year is we actually partnered up with other agencies and other private organizations. So we partnered up with our NIH, with our NSF, uh, with our Department of Agriculture, with our Department of Education, and the IDB. Uh, specifically with the IDB, which kind of plays a role here, is we partnered with them because they wanted to see if they could find an accelerator that would do business in Brazil. Um, so it was a, it's a pilot program. They're funding one award. They're funding one accelerator that is based in the U.S., but that, that will do operations in Brazil, and specifically in a in the Afro descent community. Because we, with that program, we're focused on a couple of initiatives: it's women, it's minorities, it's underserved communities, and underserved industries. Um, so that program, when they initially funded it, they assumed that you know they were going to get maybe 10, 20 applications. They ended up getting about 120 of them. Um, so they're having a hard time right now figuring out who that one winner is going to be because they're hoping, you know, they wish that they could fund it some more. Um, but that leads to the question of can we do this with other governments and other entities out there that are interested in this? Um, because the numbers are there, the success is there, uh, and the platform has been built out, and can we kind of hopefully 
um, expand this out to other to other entities that are interested. In. Um, so you can see that again, the platform itself has been built, uh, and the life cycle itself has been built. It's not just single programs, but it's actually a whole chain, and that's kind of what, what's being the success now. Thanks. Actually, you know, Narayana, as we are getting into becoming a startup nation in some ways, I think uh, when we have our governments are talking about uh, developing policies and architecting policies, we keep looking at you guys because there's so much to learn in a very innovative way. Have you created structures which are so innovative and breeds innovation all the time? So we really sort of follow you. <laughs> um, I would like to just invite Dr. Nikhil Arora uh, to share his thoughts. I think uh, it's an interesting situation. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, Mr. Ranjan has shared a lot of thoughts about what the government is doing. Uh, the one thing you must have learned about the government by working with them is uh, we are very less innovative. We tend to be less innovative. Uh, when the government people talk about innovation, they are looked with a suspicion uh, whether they are telling the right or some, saying something, something hidden around it. So I remember there is a good friend of mine who is sitting right in front of, I use an example, Sid Burbank. He is a director at uh, uh, IC Square in Austin. Last year, they approached us to set up an incubator in Andhra Pradesh and we said we will do it. They didn't trust us. They said, no, 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 they are bluffing. You know, they may not happen. It may not happen at all because in India, we have a habit of saying yes. And they, it's quite difficult. In Andhra, we say something like this, you know. <laughs> so we don't know what, what does it mean. Uh, but fortunately, uh, what I can say is about uh, in southern states, be it Telangana, be it Andhra, be it Karnataka, be it uh, uh, Kerala, there is a huge positive competition to become number one. Every chief minister talks about that we want to be number one. We want to be number one in this ranking, we want to be number one in that, that ranking. There is a great competition. There is a competition like the competition between Coke and Pepsi. Uh, any policy which has been announced in one place, is very quickly being announced in other place. It's extremely positive for the business. So I, just to give you my background, uh, I'm not a career civil servant like Mr. Ranjan. I'm a, a new entrant to the quality. I uh, entered uh, uh, to, as a, I'm more of a technocrat than a bureaucrat. So my background is in the private sector plus in academia. I have worked in several continents around the world. So when I was came, when I came to Andhra Pradesh, I'll share my experience with you. That will be very important rather than telling you about the policy which is there on the website. Uh, my experience, I was pleasantly surprised to see the language the bureaucrats are uh, talking. Uh, nowadays, the bureaucrats have started speaking about quarterly growth. What has happened last week? There is a full point agenda with the chief minister and other ministers follow up all the time. For example, like in innovation, particularly we have taken a very, very proactive step. We set up an innovation society almost two years back when the new government came into power in 2014. At the same time, we set up the innovation society. And one vision I will share with you what our chief minister has given that will reflect upon the thought process of a politician, be it Mr. Narendra Modi or be it Mr. Chandrababu Naidu. They are all giving very positive uh, uh, messages to the public. So what the Chief Minister said, he said Andhra Pradesh should become the most innovative society in the country and we should have one entrepreneur in every family. It's a great message. In earlier times, those who know the Telugu culture and uh, the old Andhra Pradesh, it was not one entrepreneur in every family, it is one, one person in, in US from every family. So it is a common saying in US, uh, US is not USA, is United States of Andhra Pradesh. There are more number of Telugu people than any Indian put together in uh, in US. You, there are some people like Mr. Ram Reddy who have made billions of dollars, who are who, who originally hail from Tirupati. So there, there, there is extremely fantastic success stories which are there. So entrepreneurship is in the blood. In the morning, somebody said about uh, uh, the uh, Indian proverb: the Indians are known to be entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, we lost the way somewhere. We were looking for jobs 
in government, we are looking for jobs, either doctor engineers, but there is a very proactive step now being taken and entrepreneurship is not looked as a taboo. Now we as in the government, we are trying to uh, take up this uh, opportunity into the new level. Just to share some of the flagship programs, I just mentioned about UT Austin program. So UT Austin, we are, uh, it's the first international incubator. We are setting up in a place called Tirupati. Tirupati is very interesting for the Indians, you know. Uh, Tirupati is a seat for Lord Balaji. Uh, Lord Balaji is uh, now uh, said to be the richest god in the world, uh, richer than Vatican. So his endowments are larger. Uh, uh, then uh, some people quote that it is almost uh, like a state of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, is very prominently located. It is only uh, six hours from Bangalore, two hours from Chennai. So we have chosen Tirupati to become the knowledge hub of Andhra Pradesh. It's a religious hub and also it should become the knowledge hub for Andhra Pradesh and for the country. Recently there is an IIT, Tirupati has been announced which is mentored by IIT Madras. We have ISR, we have uh, uh, innovation clusters which are running. Prime Minister has recently inaugurated a beautiful airport terminal. So there are a number of steps that we have seen. So when we talk about the innovation cluster, we just don't look at uh, the one activity or one incubation activity. There are a number of uh, forward steps that we took. Like in Telangana, uh, you have seen T-Hub and T-Works. The same way in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, now there is a new thought process. Uh, the Chief Minister recently said that it should not be, innovation should not be limited only to IT. Uh, we have recently passed an order that there will be an innovation officer in every department, every society, every corporation and every district. So I have been mandated to recruit more than 200 innovation officers in the next three months time. Now that's a huge step. Imagine an innovation officer in every department. Now another mandate we are giving it to the officers is that produce at least one innovation every six months. The bureaucrats are, uh, are trained, I'm sorry sir, to, <laughs> to train to say no. That's the reason. That is the reason behind it. They're not trained to say yes. Trained to say no because there's a lot of risk involved. If anything goes wrong, then the first person who will be uh, prosecuted will be the bureaucrat. It's not a private sector person. So they're trained to say no. I have a, a, a full family of bureaucrats. My own uh, family member retired as a uh, 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 senior bureaucrats in the country. So I know how it works. But now what we are saying to the bureaucrats is that please be innovative. Produce one innovation every six months. So they have to think. Now number of secretaries are coming back to us and asking what innovative things we can do. It's a process based innovation, it's a product based innovation, a technology development, it's uh, bringing up new ideas from outside, it's employing the startups. So that's a continuous changing we are doing. Now for example, just to give you another interesting example, we are designing our youth policy. In youth policy, uh, more than 10% of the, uh, the, the part we have given to innovation. There's a whole set of paragraphs which we have defined that innovation will play a major role in youth affairs. Now earlier they have completely missed it. There were earlier drafts which I have seen, but after the innovation society intervened, we said, now this is very important and they realize it. Now even 10% of the youth in the country become innovative. Imagine what the changes that we are talking about. So there is a huge shift which is happening. Government is playing active role. But at the same time, the private sector has to play a very important role. Now one criticism I have of the, uh, we will do our own criticism. So one criticism we have is that we do announce great policies, but we are still bad in implementation. Something big, because this is a new thing for us as well. So, uh, uh, you so that you have to help us out. You have to come forward and say, this is how you implement new things. This is how you implement the new innovative ideas. Thank you. That's very bright, nice insights. Because, um, you know, the first thing you've done is created employment straight away with the innovation officers. So, it goes to prove that startups and innovation does create employment. But uh, on a serious note, I think I completely agree with you create new startups and unless we create disruptive technologies, it is the young startups and the young which create employment. The large companies are having to remain stable to be cost effective. 
And if we don't create employment, I think we will be the biggest hub of a new industry called terrorism. So it's absolutely imperative to be doing this. On that, uh, Dr. Kela, uh, I think um, Dr. Ajay is somebody who started, you know, literally scaled up startups to become billion dollar organizations. And your perspective will come from a very different perspective to all of us. So, your perspective. So, uh, very good evening and uh, thank you so much for staying. At least we have some audience. So, <coughs> Oh, although you'll have to fight the traffic at the end of this, but uh, really appreciate you staying. Uh, so I, what I'll spend my time in uh, is walking through our journey of creating the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems, but focus primarily on the government intervention. So, and and uh, even though we are a small foundation, we are seeing very active engagement and very intense engagement both at the center and at the state level uh, and that shows uh, how, how much government is uh, eager to participate in this journey. Uh, before I do that, uh, I sort of wanted to answer two questions. Uh, so the first question is, should uh, why should government care about uh, innovation? Uh, and. Uh, I think innovation today is the key driver of economic uh, uh, growth uh, and the government job is around economic growth which leads to job creation uh, today globally uh, not only in India but everywhere job creation is, uh, is a very critical challenge. So it's very important for government to be engaged in innovation especially in the knowledge economy. The second question is, uh, does government intervention help? Uh, so when, whenever we talk about uh, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, everybody talks about Silicon Valley. Uh, and Silicon Valley is actually very good at solving the last mile problem and also taking the credit for solving the last mile problem. If, if you look today at the internet, economy, that is the booming economy in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley is leveraging it, but internet was really created by DARPA and they invested in, in DARPA. Uh, if I double click down into Silicon Valley and look at Google, so we look at Google and Apple and Uber now, the three of the most large companies, uh, uh, Google's uh, search algorithm was funded by NSF. Uh, then you stole my thunder. Apple, uh, Apple, guys, as you say, if you open Apple, you say there are seventy percent of Apple component, including touch screen and Siri, were funded by government uh, government organization. And without GPS, Uber would not exist uh, today. And that's not actually only limited to uh, tech companies. If you also look. At uh, outside of tech and healthcare, uh, so close to 60% of all uh, uh, you know, the game changing drugs uh, were invested by NIH. Uh, earlier, you heard someone talk about the biotech industry started investment or the VC industry. In, Biotech only came into existence 15 years after the investment uh, that was done by NIH and others. So, and the genome project right now, NIH is the uh, is leader. So, so it's, uh, it's very, very critical for government to engage in the... Uh, in fact, I, I equate government to angel investors with very, very deep pockets. So they have, they have billions of dollars of angel money to invest. And that's what they do. It's, it's very high risk, but there's a high reward as well. So going back to uh, the entrepreneurial and ecosystem journey that the foundation started, and I will inject uh, what the government has been doing all along. Uh, so we started our journey almost uh, 12 years ago, uh, somewhere around 2003. Uh, when we looked at 2003, and we are we are today in 12 countries, but uh, we were primarily focused on India 12 years ago. And India was embarking on this journey of adding a million people a month to the 
to the workforce. Actually, the million people are one who are going to turn 18 and be eligible for work. Uh, about 7 to 8 million uh, actually would seek work. Not, not everybody that turned 18 would seek work. So we were talking about uh, you and and India would do that for the next three decades. So we are still, you know, half not even halfway through that journey, where a million people a month are, are job sort of eligible. Uh, so that's on the supply side. If you look at the demand side, uh, ten years ago entrepreneurship was a four-letter word. Nobody knew new entrepreneurship. We had to rely on Tata's and Birla's and Ambani's to create jobs. Most large companies don't uh, grow by adding people. They grow by increasing productivity. Uh, and it's a known fact that 70% of all new job growth happens through startups and small businesses. So, so we have this dilemma of uh, how do you create an army of entrepreneurs in India? And as uh, Padma, Padma just pointed out, if we, if we don't find job for our youth, we would have a very large terrorist industry in the country. Uh, so, so that's how our first program started, the National Entrepreneurship Network. Basically, the idea was to educate and inspire college students to look at entrepreneurship as an alternative. So, our first founding members were IIT Bombay I and Ahmedabad and others. Um, fast forwarding to where we are today is, uh, so we. Over the last 10 to 12 years, we have trained over 3,000 faculty to teach entrepreneurship courses. On an average, about 100,000 students across 350 institutes uh, take our courses. Uh, so these are both classroom courses as well as practicums. And the way we measure our success in this program is every year on graduation, we look at how many of our students are starting companies. And then we track them to see what is the uh, what is the average jobs that they are creating. So, on an average now, our students are creating thousand companies a year. But you know the failure rate is very high. Even the VC Silicon Valley failure rate is eighty percent. And our our students and the entrepreneurs here are thrown in an environment that is not very friendly towards entrepreneurs financial ecosystem is weak, policies are not supportive and these are all first generation entrepreneurs that need a lot of hand holding and mentoring. So about, uh, okay, so so we, we launched on another program for entrepreneur support. So before I go there, uh, to inject, so now what the government of India is doing and actually a lot of the state government as well, they are taking uh, entrepreneurship program that we have developed over the last 10 years. Um, the central government has signed an agreement to take our program to 3,000 colleges. And the fact that now we are scaling to 3,000, we are transitioning from a classroom-based, teacher-based program to a MOOC-based blended learning program that we will deliver starting January. Uh, similarly, if we look at entrepreneur support, uh, we are now working to create uh, city-based uh, uh, ecosystems of, uh, if you look at Silicon Valley, you have Stanford and Berkeley kind of inspiring students to become entrepreneurs. When you step out, you have an army of mentors, an army of angel investors, every social gathering, you are bound to run into a founder or someone who is working in a, in a startup. So you learn a lot in that process. And it's important for India to create such city-based ecosystems. So we are going into institute, into cities that we have started these universities, uh, working to create local mentors, working to create local investors. We are just about working with uh, Niti Aayog to, Niti Aayog has already announced uh, they are going to create 100 incubators and they are investing 10 crore per, per incubator. But they will also need a network of mentors and investors for the incubators to succeed. So we are building those but, and, and in this day and age connect them all through a technology platform. So you will have network of mentors who can be connected to mentee through a technology platform. Think of 
something like a Yelp like platform where they can rate each other so the so that uh, the you know the uh, right side of mentors uh, bubble up similarly you need an uh, investor network you know India has a lot of HNIs for whom the first 25 lakhs or 50 lakhs is play money uh, but they don't know how to find deal structure and you have done a phenomenal job of creating angel investors but we need probably we need 5,000 angel investors so we build a three three day training program for HNIs to become angel investors so they understand how to structure deal, how to evaluate deal and then more importantly they need to connect to uh, entrepreneurs so again we will create a sort of another technology platform to connect mentors to investors in all of this Niti Ayo is participating, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship is participating. So that's our entrepreneurship journey. The, our next journey is on innovation. So if you look at innovation, uh, India is now the top five economy of the world. But when it comes to innovation, uh, I think the recent ranking we were 66. Uh, prior to that we were 78. China has just uh, sort of uh, gone into the top 25 economy of the world. So we, we are certainly nowhere there. On the other hand, when, when you look at global organization, you look at Google is led by an Indian, Microsoft is led by an Indian, um, the, the biotech lab in the University of San Diego is led by an Indian. So why is it that Indians have to leave India to become global global leaders? So we have two experiments going, uh, one at IIT Bombay and the other at the National Center for Biosciences, where we have created a physical infrastructure that is equivalent to anywhere in the world, uh, equip it with the best facility, uh, equipment that is required, but to bring in that mindset of long-term innovation and away from the mindset of first in India, best in India, to first in the world, best in the world. Uh, to make that happen, the principal investigators uh, come from, uh, so in the case of uh, NCBS, uh, it comes from Stanford and University of Kyoto. We have picked a very narrow segment, stem cell research for cardiac and neural diseases. Now 150 PhD postdocs are working with them. Similarly, at IIT Bombay, we have uh, biosciences and biomedical devices, low cost. Uh, and uh, as you heard Professor Kakkar say, we have integrated CMU to work with them. Uh, so we'll get not only faculty exchanges, but we try to get faculty to spend three years, six years, year to lead the effort. So that's one part of the innovation. Again, in both of these, while we put in some money, uh, Department of Biotechnology is, is uh, funding another 95% of what we contribute. So it accelerates that. The, the last part of the innovation, and then I'll stop, is uh, if we look today at India, we have only two industries that we are proud of, the IT industry and the pharma industry. Uh, we have a massive defense import bill. We have a 50% energy bill, uh, you name it and we are reliant on other countries. Uh, and how do you solve that? How do you catalyze a sector? And that's where my friend here comes in. And that's, so we have borrowed the SBIR program from, from US. Uh, we, we are, basically the idea is to fund large number of very small grants in the beginning. Uh, in very specific sectors and within the sectors, the, you know, the ministry would identify key areas. So import substitution might be one area. And these grants are given to small businesses uh, so that they can then lead with the goal of leading to commercialization. Uh, if you look at small businesses, uh, in India, only 5% of small businesses are more than 10 employees. Uh, China's number is more than 30% of their small businesses are more than 100 employees. So we have an enormous opportunity 
to grow our small business. Uh, so, we have multiple uh, uh, proposals with Ministry of Defense, Energy, Transport, and Niti Ayo just last week agreed to be the sort of the flag bearer of this initiative across these multiple uh, multiple verticals. So, with that, I'm going to stop. Very interesting. I think you're literally spanning the entire startup innovation ecosystem and congratulations on the thinking behind it. But you're absolutely right. I think uh, entrepreneurship in this country has become uh, from being the last option or career option to almost at the top. Just uh, something to sort of on a lighter moment, I was traveling in uh, Bangalore from the airport to the city and I found out that the Uber driver was an, actually an entrepreneur. That one and a half hours drive I was pitched a pitched in the car. So, so the world has completely changed. But I just want to bring a few points together and sort of share. I think uh, Ajay, you're absolutely right. Angel investors in this country is just the beginning. We've not even touched the tip of the iceberg. We are fast growing. I mean, how many investors would there be? Not more than 1,000, 1,500. And uh, there are many more that we do. But on the other side, on the, the flip perspective is that what we are seeing at IEN, we're seeing a huge appetite for startup investing. I mean, uh, we have, we've done, uh, what, 40 deals last financial year, and each one of them has gone oversubscribed. We raised more than what we need. Uh, we also invested in a cybersecurity company from LA, and uh, they were raising two million on the network and we raised three and a half million literally in 38 minutes. So there is a huge appetite which I think is very important. Uh, you know, the groundwork is done and we can pile on to that to take it to the next level. The second thing that I think which, uh, which got alluded is growing companies. You know, startups have to be on a high growth uh, track. And I think growing companies is not only, we have a huge domestic market in the country and that's a great advantage, but increasingly what we were seeing, and I'll tell you this because we've been on IE for a long time, we were seeing uh, propositions, software products, IT products, sort of being created for global markets. Today we are seeing ventures being created for domestic and global markets. And I think that's a big, big change because it allows companies to grow quickly and then scale quickly. But what does happen, and I'm sort of putting a bit of a challenge on to this panel because this is what we are seeing. We were investing 25 lakhs, 50 lakhs. I mean, Dhruva, which is iconic in the Indian, invest, Indian angel investing uh, scenario, we invested what? 56, uh, 56 lakhs, which was at that time $100,000, right, at that currency rate. Today it's gone into, I don't know, series B, C, D, E, and it's sitting in California and doing global partnerships. But I think what we are seeing is a lot a lot of the governments, and kudos to what uh, you folks have done, what uh, angels are, that has started sort of now dribbling in, in some ways. You know, the first million dollars, first half a million dollars. I think the gap that we are seeing in the ecosystem is the next, the pre-series A, the, what I would say from a million to three million. That is a gap and many good high performing companies are falling off the cliff. So this is where the new gap is and uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, just share because we've sort of been a pioneer in angel investing, we've sort of been a pioneer in creating companies across sectors, manufacturing, uh, semiconductor, uh, stem cell, clinical drug trial, and of course IT and software products and hospitality and all of those. But I think uh, what we are trying to do, and we'd love to learn from all of you and see if we can partner, is uh, we are putting a fund together on IAN to literally plug that one, two, three, or four million gap. And that should allow the companies to uh, pick up a runway and then go in for a series uh, A which is more like 8, 10 million. So I just wanted to put that on the table because you know as you start and I you know T-Hub has got 800 companies or something. As you put these into play um, I think angels are good and that is happening and that started and I think it will increase. It's becoming a badge of honor, it's becoming a reputational uh, badge so it's good. But I think this is where we are seeing the next gap which we think we should uh, plug. Just so that, uh, please. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> Padmajai, 
refer to it when I mention my opening remarks that we are putting together a T-Hub Innovation Fund and this is precisely the gap that we intend to address. So the size of the fund is 100 crores, roughly about uh, 15 million dollars and the state government is uh, providing one-fifth of it, 20 percent and we are in the process of mobilizing the rest from other uh, networks and P's and VCs etc. and about half of it we have already done that. We intend to launch it in November, on, on 5th November precisely, because that day will mark the first anniversary of the year. So I would like to discuss that further with you. We'll be very happy if you can uh, step in. Sure, we love and This to fund will be completely professionally managed. CTP most likely will be the agency which will manage it for us. Yeah. Sure. That number of IEN investor members are sitting on the India Aspiration Fund Investment Committee and on the TIPP committee. Can I add to, to that? Uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right because we, today we have no more than 10 that are in the series uh, series A funding range. But this again here, uh, we could steal the SBIC program. Absolutely, <laughs> I want to sit with him. No, from the and work with our government to create those SBIC companies uh, because most of these uh, Series A investors are all foreign entities that have, that have come. We don't have any Indian Indian entities that are Series A funder, uh, VCs. So that may be a... But interestingly, there's a lot of uh, domestic money that is coming in into SLPs. So that's encouraging. But it still needs overseas uh, some overseas money. But yeah, SBIC models, uh, SIDBI has tried, and uh, it's trying. But there, there is clearly uh, some work to be done there. Sorry. Uh, uh, setting up the fund to for the viability gap is extremely important. But what we have done is a very interesting case. We have done is uh, we have created something called the Sumoto proposal. So the real challenge for the entrepreneurs is who is your first customer. Getting the money is okay. You can raise two, three billion dollar, but what about your first customer? Nobody trusts you. You are a young guy or you are a young startup. Uh, nobody wants to test your product. Everybody says that come with a proof of concept. So what we have done in the uh, in Andhra is we said that if you are if you have a workable solution and if you can create a workable prototype, we will buy a product up to five crores. And we have done that. We have done one in IoT, where we have put in sensors uh, for measuring the water level for reservoirs. And we have done in two, three other products in education and other places. And we have pegged around 50 crores exclusively for this. So number of technologies that we are looking at. So it's a very interesting case. Once the government become your first customer, and then we say the second customer, which is the first order, first order we guarantee up to five crores. Your second order, third order, of course, your merit will come. When the government becomes your first customer, the whole world is open to you. Right. Actually, that's a great help because uh, sustainable companies are built on the top line, not on investment. Nare, you had something to share. Yeah, I think uh, I think the one thing that gets lost in uh, discussion of assisting you know, startups and also from the perspective of how government helps, we, we're talking all about finances, you know, investing money into the startups, but one thing that we've realized is at the bare end of it, you got to realize that people that are starting these companies may not be financial geniuses. They are your engineers, they are your technologists, but they might not have the financial capacity to get past that death valley that all of us have discussed on this panel and previous panels. Um, and that's one thing we realized as well. And that's why we came up with something like, like the accelerator program. Um, to help them get from their technology capacity to the financial capacity and gain that knowledge and then move on and get more capital when they need it. Uh, the other thing is uh, with government innovation research is the easing of the access into the market. Um, the one thing that we've done in our programs, from whether it's SBIR, whether it's accelerators, whether it's SBIC, is we've not only kind of eased up on the regulatory portion, but also on the financial portion. So for example, in SBIR, um, we're funding high-risk, high-reward technologies, but we are taking no equity in these companies. We are uh, allowing them to have data rights for three to five years to kind of get their footprint into the market and have some sort of space there. Uh, within SBIC, 
uh, we cap the amount that, that uh, these firms can charge, whether it's interest or equity securities, so that the burden is not wholly on these startups, so they can actually viably get up and hire more individuals, get their product or technology into certain marketplaces, in nationally and globally. Uh, and we've seen success there, and that's why we continue to do so in these, in these arenas. No, I think that that's very interesting, and uh, I must say that um, the government in India actually has started becoming extremely innovative. I think the startup certification program and the benefits that uh, that is sort of giving to startups it just goes to say how innovatively we are thinking. And to a larger question, yes, it is not only money, but mentoring and market access that makes it happen. So at IEN, in fact, that's something which is our time. to say that is more important, which is non-financial. But on that note, I would like to open it up for any questions. We have time for two, so let's take the best. Yeah, yeah Ajay. Uh, uh, my name is Ajay Mukreja. I have been involved. I've been involved with uh, the startup, both as an advisor and mentor, in the recent months after my retirement. I've spent a lot of time looking at innovative technologies in both North America, West Europe, and in some of the emerging markets. What I've realized is. Uh, in the last few months, a lot of people in India are trying to invent the wheel. I don't know why we can't bring those silos together. The same technologies that were developed in 1980s and 90s in Japan, United States and Germany are being developed by some of our innovators. And while it's, we keep talking about funding problems, the biggest problem is what they'll realize there is no growth. And many of them want to look at same idea. I was in Chhattisgarh with I am Chhattisgarh, I am Raipur two days ago and met close to 100 plus innovators and I realized everyone is talking about the same idea. And I like what Nikhil just said that you are helping them to get the first customer. This is going to be a problem for hundreds and thousands of startups. I don't see money as a problem. I see scaling up, getting the first one crore order for a company with help of what Mr. Jay Shranjan is saying with the government buying or you helping them to get the customer is just a small problem. How do you scale up? How do you get the employment? I have a few suggestions. One of the suggestions that I said is try and do joint ventures, partners between those successful startups in North America, leave the Silicon Valley, look at the rest of the world and bring startups to uh, join hands here. Secondly, bring together those SMEs in India who know what the problem is, but they don't know what the solution is. And consider innovative arms like Mahindra has started within the organization. Instead of trying to create the same incubation innovation centers which are going to have 90% or more failures, it's not going to solve the India's employment problem, what Mr. Ajay Keda you talked about. There's no way 7 million jobs can be created every year in this country every month in this country, I'm sorry. Thank you. I think they are, uh, those are very insightful suggestions and I'm sure we pick up on them. Uh, would you like to? Yeah. I introduced myself last session. You are not there. I'm Professor SKJ, I teach management and uh, uh, innovation and creativity. Before that, I was 37 years in the industry. I'm touching at the very root points. We accept very coldly 80% is the failure required. Why? Have you ever realized by the failure? Why put that failure rate be 50%? I'll tell you why. I'm a mentor to few of my friends who have got SME. A. Ease of doing business. We are not paying enough attention to it. A person who is doing commercial job, why is charge the commercial rate of electricity? Which is higher than residential, why? Is he doing a crime? Is generating wealth. For everything in this country and maybe many other countries, there could be two slabs, one residential, one commercial. That should be charged lower. They are creating wealth. They are sleeping partner, government, they are sleeping partner. They are collecting tax and paying to government. Second, all of my friends whom I am helping as a mentor in SME, they are so tense when the bad debt comes. Now ask them, have you collected a payment? No. No, Mr. Jain. You are paying to the government whether you have collected the payment or not. Yes. If tomorrow your payment doesn't come, then money is gone. There has to be structure change. SME should pay to the government or only when they have collected the payment. 
You see, the mindset that commercial is something which should be judged higher should just go away from the SME sector. And many of you have got the connect with the CM or PM can initiate this change. Please bring down this failure rate and be the second biggest reason I was in Bank of India as a technical officer. I was 37 in industry. Is the failure because of marketing. Anybody who is entrepreneur cannot be everything rolled into one. He can be good only in one or two areas. And that's why Mr. Agrawal, your suggestion of the first order is a huge thing. Thirdly, even if he is able to market, it's on credit basis. And that becomes the biggest problem for SME to collect the payments. When India, once you supply something to somebody, you become a sort of a sorry for using the word beggar. There has to be some penalty on the companies which are dealing with SME, some kind of framework that their money should be natural. But time is limited, I'll stick myself. Thank you. Once again, very interesting insights. I'm sorry we'll have to close, sir, because uh, we have some commitments the panelists have to go. So on that note, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it was the end of the day session, but very engaging. And thank you, panelists, on both sides of my Well, that concludes the inaugural event of the U.S.-India Innovation Forum. You know, sometimes these kind of events are actually the culmination of a project, whether you've written a report or written a book, but uh, this is actually the first step in what we expect to be a, a long journey. Over the coming year, we'll develop uh, sectoral-specific roundtables to have these type of discussions among people that are leading on innovation, whether it's innovation in healthcare, innovation in agriculture, and other sectors. Trying to tie folks together, I mean, you saw from the panelists on stage today, uh, coming up with plans uh, just as they're making their own speeches and remarks. So we'll try to replicate that many times over over the coming year. Uh, thanks again to Ficky for their support in hosting and, or and uh, helping to organize this, uh, this event. Uh, thanks also to the Wadwani Foundation, uh, Coca-Cola, Uber, and Qualcomm uh, for their financial support for the Innovation Forum. And also lastly to in Diaspora, the Indus Entrepreneurs, and to the U.S. India Business Council uh, for helping generate attention and interest. Uh, and thanks to, all, to you for participating, and uh, we'll see you again next year in Washington, D.C., uh, and some several forums in between. Thank you. Bye.